DJ Wilson reports on St. Louis and we'll meet him next on City Corner. City Corner. Well, DJ Wilson has worn a lot of hats in his career. He joins us now. DJ, welcome to the show. Thank you. Let's see. Journalist, reporter, radio talk show host, PR guy. Pain in the neck. Yeah, all those above. I wasn't going to mention that no, one. That's Coach. The, <laughs> Coach sort of. Third, third grade basketball. <laughs> I just finished the season. I survived it. A lot of people uh, remember your byline for, I don't know, it was almost a decade, I guess, you wrote for the Riverfront Times. Right. It was 95 to 2003, and I covered City Hall, I covered the DSEG case, I covered a lot of urban issues uh, as a staff writer for the Riverfront Times, and since then I've been at East West Gateway as a um, communications coordinator, or what I sometimes call the Minister of Disinformation. <laughs> You're the PR flack, right? That, that's it. exactly. And <laughs> flack means you take the, the hits. But no, it's, it's uh, for East West Gateway, and then I also freelance on the side for stlmag.com and St. Louis Magazine. Right, and on Monday nights on KDHX yes. 88.1 FM, you do a half-hour talk show called right. Collateral Damage. Right, for 14 years, started in 2001, and... Um, we have a lot of, well, you were a guest on not, not too long ago, but during the I'm first still wondering why, because <laughs> well, you, you, well, you interview a lot of politicians and things. Right. A lot of it is politics. Like during Ferguson, we had on Thomas Harvey, the guy from Art City Defenders. We had on uh, Vervis Jones, uh, Mike Jones from the, city, from the county, Todd Swanstrom from Mumsold. So we, we try to keep it current on events of the day, but we also, because it's an alternative media, uh, it's a community station, and we, I'm a volunteer there, obviously, so they can cut my pay in half and it's the same, you know. Uh, we, we try to fill the gaps, and, and there, there's people that couldn't get on the radio somewhere else or are not as long, and because there's no commercials, uh, t 28 minutes on KDHX of talk, to be on KMOX or a commercial station, you'd be on like an hour and a half, because they have news and commercials right. and traffic and weather and everything else. We don't right. do that. Yeah, and for, if people aren't familiar with KDHX, it's mostly music, but it's, it's the type of um, uh, music that you won't hear on other radio stations, not Top 40, that people have their own kind of niche shows. Right, it's 88.1, 88.1 FM, and every two to four hours there's a different show on, and you could go from reggae to country to all, to uh, any, any kind of music there is. On Monday nights is where the news and talk is. It's from 7 p.m. to 10.30 at night, and it covers literature. Jean Ponzi's on there with the Earthworm environmental Earth store, right. and she's been on the, sh on the uh, radio station for like 112 years, I think. I'm, <laughs> I, I'm kidding, Jean, but Scott, it's, it's a long time. Scott Miller years. and Deborah Sharn do a theater show? Yes, yes. There's theater and, and there's li uh, literature for the Halibut from 9 to 10, that, with readings of poetry and stuff. So it's stuff you would not get else. Although St. Louis Public Radio is wonderful too, but it's, it's more driven by news and, and talk where KDHX, as I always say, is 168 hours in the week. 164 of those hours is music. Only four hours of Monday night is news and talk, and we run from 8.30 to, to 9. And I found that podcasting now is a big thing. Right now, our podcasts are down, but once we start doing that several years ago, we get a lot of views from people that listen to the show on their handhelds, on their computers, uh, at their own convenience. And people do podcasts so they can listen to them at don't have to listen to the show live. Is exactly. That, that's the point right, of that, right? Right. People can do it while they're working out, while they're walking, while they're at work, whatever. And it, the thing is, it, there is a lot. Like, Vervis Jones is one of my favorite guests because he says such good things, and he's been around for so long, he's so experienced. And I don't know when Vervis has been on another show, but mine. And I wish he were because, I mean, it's, it's, it's Tim Fitch, for example, the St. Louis County Police Chief. I had him on my show like three, four years ago. And he's a very elusive guest. He's one of those guests when you ask him a question, there was no filter. There was no hesitation. To, he wasn't thinking of what politically correct thing to say. He would just say it. Now, of course, he got fed up with things and resigned <laughs> not too long ago. But now he's on media a lot. I don't take credit or blame for that. But sometimes 
people get exposure and they get comfortable and then the people find out about that and it goes on. And uh, politicians, are, they're their own sort of unique animals. Right. Right? Well, I had the three mayoral candidates on uh, when the mayoral last election. <laughs> I don't know, if it was a straw poll. Uh, we had podcasts for each one, Lewis Reed, Francis Slay, and Jimmy Matthews. And Jimmy Matthews got more views and clicks than Francis Slay or Lewis Reed, only because Jimmy was funny. He mm -hmm. wasn't a serious candidate, but he was funny. Mm -hmm. So you never know. I mean, yeah, but, but politicians obviously are, are hedging most of the time. Yeah, how, how do you approach that as an interviewer? Do you just sort of accept it? Are you always, are you, uh, are you what's the word for that? Is it gadfly? Well, you, you well, try to stir the pot up a little bit? Well, at some point, you know they're not going to give you the right answer, or, or, or any answer. <laughs> I mean, you push them to some point, but then you, you just you shrug your shoulders and move on. I, I find, I did that, any election that comes up like that, I try to have the guests on that are candidates. But the interesting guests are the guests that are, usually have a cause or uh, are doing it for the same reason that I'm doing the radio show, not for money, but for something that they want to get done or something they want to shed some light on. And those people are, are, are usually the best people to have on because they're passionate about something they want to change, you know. Well, you know, my background's in, in radio broadcasting, too, so I interview a lot of people. What do you think, what do you think are the qualities that make for a good interviewee? Well, the problem I had with this, because most of my experience in journalism was in print, was when, you, when you're asking a question in print journalism and somebody goes off on a tangent you have no interest in, you let them talk because you figure, I'm not going to use that. They, and it makes them feel better because they're talking and they, they think they're, they're, they're going to listen. But and you know, if you get paid by the hour, it works exactly. out. Exactly. Yeah, really listen to them. And you realize, I'm not going to put that in the article, but they don't know that, okay? And so this is kind of, and radio, as you know, it's real time usually. You're, you, and if somebody goes off on a tangent, you got to bring them back. You have to right. like cut them off, kind of, and that's the difficult thing to do. I think people, uh, if they're not too oh, nervous, is a problem, obviously, and you don't want dead air. You want somebody to answer your question at length or somewhat at length. But I find that one of the problems I have on radio is uh, is telephone interviews, because if you ask talk to somebody on telephone, on one level, somebody's interviewing interview on the telephone. They feel kind of at ease. It's almost like they, they think they're just talking to somebody on the phone, and you can get them to say things that not in, intentionally, but they say things they wouldn't normally say. The problem with it is, mm. you can't get their attention to, to divert them or cut them off. If they're in the studio with you, you can wave at them and say, "Cut it!" With, on right. I found that too. Like it's easy to like talk over somebody by mistake because you're not getting the you know visual signs from them. Exactly. Yeah. But some people don't want to have the inconvenience of coming to the studio, so you do it. And obviously. I, I joke that I have dozens of listeners, but I, I, don't, I don't know how many people listen at 8.30 at night, and that's why the podcast is so good, because when you have the podcast, you can listen when you want, and you can tell on some shows, I usually, without fail, get a couple hundred people that click on the podcast over the next week or two, but certain ones, for example, Show Me Cannabis, when I have anybody from there on, bingo, in a week they have five, 600 views, because they have a network of people, they put it on websites, they send the link out, and they're organized. Huh. So that means that's something they feel passionately We're about. We're hoping so. And you, you've, you've written about that at, at, yes, at yes. stlmag.org. stlmag.org, uh, stlmag.com. Excuse me. Uh, I, I, I've done that for the last couple of years. It was a weekly piece I did for the first year, 2013. Last year, it got done about two or three times a month, and now it's about a couple times a month. And I try to fill the gaps. One of the issues I try to do a lot of on is the school transfer case because it, it was so misunderstood and so misconstrued in the media. Not That's when students have the ability right. to transfer to a different right. school. Right, right. Yeah. And it was a thing, that stems back from when I was at, at, at the Riverfront Times in, I'd say, 1996-97, when Wellston lost its accreditation. And I looked at that statute that said you could go to another district, and I called the guy from DESE, the Department of Elementary and Secondary Ed, and I said, why wasn't this challenged? Why didn't they do this? And he said then, this is like 15 years ago, well, no one got a lawyer and challenged it. And that's what happened when Elkin Kistner got this lawsuit going. Now it's seven or eight years ago, and the legislature still hasn't come to terms with it. So it's just, you know. How do you come up with uh, stories like that? Do you just write about what interests you? Well, or does well the one advantage of stlmag.com is it, you can, if something's quirky and different and you're interested in it, you go do it, and I, they've given me the leeway to do those stories, and stories that, for instance, one of my favorites, late, about a year ago, I did a, a piece on, on Globe Drug, down, on, uh, down by Soulard. Mm -hmm. Globe Drug used to be on Cherokee Street, and it closed, the last Globe Drug store, it's down on, uh, God, is it Broadway or 7th? It's down by Sular, down by the brewery. Didn't the Left for Life guys' father own it? Yes, yes. The Marshall Cohen. Cohen. Yes, Marshall Cohen. Yeah, yeah. And, and just, it's a 
an amazing story that you, you just can't, I can't get enough of it, it's so goofy. But I did a long piece on that and someone told me it was uh, the most, it was done on Globe Dog by a factor of three. <laughs> but it was interesting and that too got a lot of hits on, 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 the, on the website because people knew about Globe Dog and they sent out their friends and moved away. And so, now so. since you write for St. Louis Magazine's website, does that mean that it doesn't always show up in the print version? Usually it doesn't, yeah. I, I've done some things on the Q&A version and the print uh, the last few months and the April issue of St. Louis Magazine, I have a Q&A with uh, Jeff Rainford. Uh -huh. and you, did, you did one story, I think it was fairly recently, I think you called it Fixing Ferguson. Right. And I enjoyed it because you talked a lot about a gate at your house. Yes. And you kind of do a parallel there. Right. It was Mending Fences was the, was the headline. I live in Arsenal and Grand and there was a lot of, because of the Shaw incident with the uh, killing there too, there was, the night of the grand jury, there was a lot of demonstrations and tear gas and broken windows and stuff. And somebody had broken into a drugstore and sold some drugs and ran through my backyard because I live right there and they broke down my fence. So I wrote about that whole, and usually I try not to inject myself in these things, but that was, it, did came, that to me. Time. it came to me, it had to. And you seem to have the impression that Governor Nixon wasn't going to do anything to help you. Right, <laughs> my, 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 the, 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 the joke lead was, uh, somebody should fix my fence, but if Governor Nixon had supplied the lumber, he wouldn't deploy the lumber to fix my fence. Hey DJ, particularly when you write it, when you put yourself out there in any kind of opinion, but particularly politics, you're going to make some people mad. So does that bother you, and, and do people let you know when they think you're full of it? Uh, I, I already know I'm full of it, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, but no, I, mean, I, I, I did a piece, uh, I, we were saying off camera, Joyce Abusi is a, a behind the scenes political force for the, for the Democratic Party. And I did a piece in 1999 called Joyce Abusive, because that, that was her nickname. And that, uh, that uh, did not stand me in good stead for a lot of people. And a lot of politicians, they, they're very thin skinned. You'd think they wouldn't be because yeah. they're out there, but because they're out there and because they're always concerned about their hate to say this, short-term self-interest, they don't know what's gonna be look, make them look bad. But no, those eight years I was at the Riverfront Times, I, I, I pissed off a lot of people. Well, you yes. know, I don't usually get a lot of, I don't get much mail to begin with, and I never get hate mail, and I actually sort of got a hate letter about six months ago, and it sort of devastated me for a couple of minutes, only because I wasn't used to it. Right. So do you read it, or do you ignore that stuff? Or? There was one letter I saved from the Riverfront Times that was handwritten, that told me I should leave town and I wasn't <laughs> happy. And if you're so miserable, why don't you change? And it was just a very personal, vindictive thing. Right. I, I sort of enjoyed it, though. Yeah, you, know, you could tell they put well, a lot of work well, into well, it. They, they showed that they read the article, you know, right. basically. They right. may have mis misconstrued it, but they, they, they paid attention. We need to take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about some other things, including what you do at East West right. Gateway. And sure. ex explain that, because I think a lot of people don't even know what that is. A lot of people don't. So we'll be back with more City Corner with DJ Wilson right after this. Poisoning affects one million children today. If you're pregnant or have young children and your home was built before 1978, you could be at risk. Learn how to protect your family. To find your home's danger zones, the health effects, or just to find help, log on to leadfreekids.org. I love the show. I watch the show every night. We have great guests on there. I enjoy watching the best of the STL. I love the show, and I love to watch it all the time. Thank you very much. I just recently started watching the program, and so far I have really enjoyed it. It's wonderful what you do with the kids or anything, and putting St. Louis on the map. Hi, I really like uh, your show. 
Hi, I love your show. I watch it every day, every time you come on. I love your show. We may get to enjoy retirement, but our old cell phones shouldn't. Recycle them. It's easy, it's free, and it's good for the environment. Hi, this is Richard Garn. Please answer the call to recycle. I'm Steve Potter. Welcome back to City Corner. Our guest for this episode is DJ Wilson. Uh, you know him from KDHX Radio, Monday nights 8 o'clock, his talk show Collateral Damage. Also, you've read his work on stlmagazine.com, sometimes in the print version. He was a longtime uh, reporter for the Riverfront Times, too. Have I left anything else? You, you also worked a newspaper out of town, like in Texas. I worked at the Houston Post, which is a daily paper for six years in the late 80s, early 90s, as a medical reporter. I covered Texas Medical Center, Michael DeBakey, all that stuff. Then I uh, freelanced for about a year. Then I was with the uh, Houston version of the Riverfront Times called the Houston Press, an alternative weekly that was there for two years as a staff writer. Mm -hmm. uh, I know you grew up here in St. Louis, but right. so did you, did you? Did you get a degree in journalism? I'm did afraid you, as a reporter, so. Reporter, is afraid. that what you wanted to do? Um, I was. It was the only thing I could do, I think, really. <laughs> and I always say, um, were it not for the Vietnam War, I would not have done that probably because that back then. It was either go to college or be shot at it in Vietnam, so I went to college, and I, I barely scraped by. And, and the other thing that I think is fun telling is that uh, I got into journalism school at the University of Missouri. The first, I, I got in that class, and the next semester they raised the standards. They, they figured, like, this thing, let this guy in. Because back then, it was poor Watergate. You'd get in with a C average. It was no big. Now it's hard to get into the journalism school. You'd like to get a B average or above. But back then, it was like you could walk and chew gum. You were in journalism school. Well, you know, uh, most of the reporters, I'm not a reporter, but most of the reporters I work with at St. Louis Public Radio, I mean, most of them, I think, even have their masters. I mean, they're serious. Right, right. And, and, and I. I I go back, uh, this might be the first sighting of a Buddy Hackett story, but when people ask me, kids like journalism, like high school, college kids about journalism, I always go back to this Buddy Hackett story. Buddy Hackett's son wanted to be a comedian, and Buddy Hackett told him, if you're going to be a comedian to make money, to be famous, to be noticed, to any other reason, don't do it. If you're going to be a comedian because that's all you can think about and that's what you have to do, then go be a comedian. That's what I think about journalism. I mean, it, it's a rough trade. It's low paid. You get a lot of rejection. It's almost like acting or something else. You have to go into it because you just are compelled to do it because there's not many rewards, financial or otherwise. Part of my reasoning, too, to go into it was I have to do something that's fun. Well, yeah. That's even more important than money to me. And if something that's fun, and the media is fun. Somebody told me, uh, if a guy I used to work with, uh, so they used to ask him, what, what do you do as a reporter? He said, well, I call up strangers and I ask them questions. And that's kind of what you do. You, you, you have a license to talk to people that you would normally not only talk to. In fact, that's your job, basically. What do you think, without getting into too much detail, because I want to talk about your uh, day right. job here in just a second, but boy, you and I have both seen media change a lot since we both got into it. You know, uh, newspapers have shrunk, on-air jobs right. have shrunk. What do you make of it all? I, I think part of it is, on one level, if you want access to an audience, it's better now than it was 20, 30 years ago. I mean, you can, get, you can write something, you can get it online, you can get it on a blog, get it on a website. The access is better, but financial support is much worse. Even when I was in journalism and it was popular because of Watergate, it was hard to get a job. But Newspapers back then had profit margins like oil companies. They were making a lot of money. Now they're not doing that. But do you think people are as cautious as they should be about believing what they just happened to read? You know, now there are so many sources of information, right. correct or incorrect. When I was young, there was like three news shows you could watch because there were only three stations. Right. Everybody probably read the same newspaper. And now you could be getting information from, you know, two dozen sources. Well, it's, it's like everything else. It is a mixed bag. I mean, you, it, there's a good side to it and a downside to it. You have to really be discerning and you have to read these sites and, and investigate them and then learn from experience. If you read something from a site that's BS, you find that later, well, don't trust that site anymore and go on. But the tr difficult thing is if it's hard to make a living at it, but you can make a living at it, but you have to be adaptable and flexible. Hmm. That's the key to it. Well, yeah. Uh, okay, listen, uh, I know they don't pay you a lot in radio, but I'm sure you're very well compensated at East West Gateway. And the reason I bring that up is because I didn't realize, until you and I were talking off the air, that that's an organization that's 50 years old. Right. I don't think most people know about it. East West Gateway Council of Governments, basically what it does is divides up federal money that comes through town for transportation projects and other regional issues like public safety, uh, emergency response, air quality. See, 
And the reason it was instituted 50 years ago was it used to be federal money would come into a town or an area and the city would fight the county, the county would fight the state, da 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 da. So the east, these council of governments were formed in these metropolitan areas and this, the board of directors are the top elected officials of the region. Francis Slay, Steve Elman from St. Charles, Mark Kern from St. Clair County, and Jefferson County, St. Louis County, Steve Stinger, they're all on the board. They meet once a month and they try to divide up the pie, how to spend the money. See, I guess maybe that's something I didn't really realize. I figured, you know, um, the big check came in the mail addressed to St. Louis, but a lot of money comes to the region. Right. It used to be the state or the city or the county, and if you had a road that transfers all three, how do, how do you spend the money? So this was invented or instituted in 1965 all across the nation, and here it was East West Gateway. And they meet, it's the only place where the regionals and leaders meet once a month to even look at each other. So it has a lot of potential so you're saying that's a good thing, right? Oh, it's a good thing, yes. Well, usually it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, it has a lot of potential. It's mostly focused on transportation. But a recent study, we do studies too. We're kind of like a think tank in a way. We did a study about racial disparity. And we started the study before Ferguson happened. But sometimes I jokingly say East West Gateway documents the obvious for those who deny the, deny the obvious. So why would East West be interested in racial disparity? Well, to determine where roads should go, where Metrolink should go, where transit should go, where 911 response should go, you need to know the demographics of the region. You know where people live, where people work, what the income levels are, who needs this, who needs that. And racial disparity is a thing that affects all of us. And the median household income for white households in St. Louis area, the area, is sixty thousand dollars. The median household income for blacks in the area is thirty thousand dollars, half that. Wow. So there's there's real disparity here, and that causes real problems. At East West Gateway, we, we're not into recommending what to do about that or how it got to be, but this is the way it is. What else did you find from that study? Well, it's it's pretty distressing, really. It really is because things since. 2010 and 2012, 2013, things have gotten worse in the disparity index, okay? You mean the rich getting rich or the poor getting poorer? Right, and, and the difference between white and black has gotten somewhat worse from 20, 2010 to 2012. Now, historically, you go back 30, 40 years, it's not that way. But uh, the, uh, in, the infant mortality rate among whites in, in the St. Louis region is half that of blacks, okay? That's a bad thing, obviously. High school, people without a high school diploma, 9% of whites don't have a high school diploma, 17% of blacks don't have a high school diploma. There, there's just base, 30% uh, of black households live below the federal poverty line. Uh, it's less, 9% for uh, whites. So, I mean, there, there's this definite, so when people sort of say, well, what's the difference? We got Barack Obama's president, da, da, da. Well, it's, it's much more complex than that. And the thing with East West Gateway, we provide the data, now, and then the, the agencies and the governments have to take that data and try to do something with and it. And your role with East West Gateway, you're like the PR guy. Right. I'm, well, I, I don't have any problem with people we call PR, but it's public information. We're, we're, we're a quasi-governmental thing. We're funded by the federal government, but I'm not a federal employee. So when you do a study like on racial, racial disparity, is that for your members, the mayors of all the communities you just mentioned? It's, it's not right. just for the public, is it? There's an ongoing, yes, it is, it's on our website at ewgateway.org, or it's available on there. Where we stand is, a, is an ongoing series we do where we compare St. Louis to 34 other metropolitan areas, how we stand in, in um, income, economy, transportation, in this case, uh, the, the racial disparity index. And we're like the sixth most segregated area of those 35 cities uh, when you compare it by census tracts and stuff like that. I mean, St. Louis has gotten, I lived in Houston, Texas for nine years. People say, oh, things are different in St. Louis now. And they are when I came back in 95. But you compare it to Houston, it's not even, it's, I mean, we, we're not very polyglot when you compare it to most of those cities. I mean, we've gotten, we've gotten better in terms of integration, but it's, we still have a long way to go. Are we going to do it? I, I think people, one by one, neighborhood by neighborhood, I think things generally are getting better. Uh, but God knows there's a lot of, just the recent thing in Ferguson, as you know, with Ferguson, among the municipalities in the county, Ferguson was really not the worst one. It just happened to be that's where Michael Brown was killed and it brought the spotlight to it. But you, you put the spotlight on other municipalities, there are more problems you, there's, there's, there's something I, I would like you to address since you deal with the media too. Um, and I'm in the media and I love the media and we need it to cover things, but sometimes I wonder how clearly we see things. Oh, so I, I, I want to use the Ferguson coverage for example. Right. Do you think the media covered it do you think what you saw in the media was an accurate reflection of what was happening? No, I don't. 
I don't. And I, 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 I was a stringer for, for the New York Times during that, and I was out there. So I was part of the problem, too. But I, was just, I just did legwork for the Times. I just, I'd go out there and I'd call in, this happened, that happened, I'd call in a few quotes. I didn't write stuff. I had a couple of credit lines, but I wasn't a person out there. When you see national media address something that you know better, you realize, oh my God, what am I listening to? I know about people anything? not from here that are afraid to come to St. Louis just right. because of you right. know the images in their mind of what they think it's like every day on the street. Right, right, and and and, and the the complexity of the situation is very seldom explained well in media. You have to, it takes time and and space and and attention to do that, and. With the folk, I talk CNN, uh, Fox, uh, even MSNBC, some of the stuff that was said was just off the charts. And I did, I covered that a little bit in one of my pieces I did uh, back in um, October or November. Some of the misconceptions that happened. That For just, St. Louis Magazine. Yeah, yeah, it's on sdlmag.com still. But it's it just, uh, well, it's a small example. These Tibetan monks were going th touring through town, okay, and I, I, they come through town every year, and they're on my radio show, and they. It's broken English, and but I don't know. I'd have them on anyway. So they showed up at Quick Trip, uh, the burned out Quick Trip in Ferguson, and it was all over Twitter for a couple of days. Oh, these people came to bet for this. No, they didn't. They were in town anyway. You know, but the little <laughs> misconceptions like that got repeated over and over again. Right, and I don't know. I, it seems like a lot of people getting into journalism. It, it seems like uh, you know everybody is on a learning curve, especially when you start out. But it seems like, when I started out in journalism, you couldn't get a job in a city like St. Louis right out of school, and now yeah. you can. Oh yeah, you can. Well, part of it. I hate to say this, but it's cheaper to hire younger people with less experience is one level of it. The other level is with the technology now, you don't need much to be on Twitter or, or put your or live streaming. And some of that's good because it's witnessing things that are real right there. But people have to realize that Twitter is just one person typing in there is handheld half the time. And I'm that can these, be anything. I know I'm fighting a losing battle, but I'm not a big social media person. I don't even like Facebook. What do you? What? Well, that's why with my day job at, at East Coast Gateway, I have to be somewhat aware of that. And what, one thing I do like about Twitter is that it's sort of like a news service. It's like a wire service. You go on there, and if you follow the right people, the institutional ones and people you trust, you can figure out what's going on on a minute by minute basis. You know, but you have to be skeptical of some of the stuff that's on there because. Who's saying this and why? There's always an agenda, no matter who they are. And it, is this being filtered by someone who knows what's going on? You working on an interesting story right now? Well, I'm doing a follow-up on the whole John Hancock thing, and I'm using I'm going to do a piece for SDLMag.com. Tom Schweik related. Right. Stuff. So, uh, more about the, how the media handled it, because that I think was fascinating. The whole the, the, the guy goes off the record, then he commits suicide. What do you do with that information? You know, and how do you treat an issue where a guy's going to suicide? Well, DJ Wilson, it's been great to get to know you. I hope people listen to you Monday. Monday evenings on KDHX. Read your stuff at Double STL, my audience, yes. STLMag.com. <laughs> Thank you. And good luck with the East West Gateway cool. Council of Governments. Did I get that right? You did, you did. did. DJ Wilson, thanks so much for thank being you. our guest today. I'm Steve Potter, and thank you for watching. I hope you'll join me next time. Bye bye.